Thank you, Governor Lamont and First Selectman Peter Tessie. It's an honor to serve as your Master of Ceremonies today for the second Greenwich Economic Forum. So thank you, Bruce and Jim, for inviting me to represent Yahoo Finance here. Now, our first panel of the day is a real treat. We have two returning keynote speakers joining one another in a fireside chat. They need no introduction. It is Ray Dalio, the co-CIO of Bridgewater Associates, and Paul Tudor Jones, the CIO of Tudor Investment Corporation, two legends in the industry in conversation. Hey, um, I've got to just say one thing. My, as you know, my third daughter, Dottie, is graduating from uh, getting a master's in data science in December. And so the, the question is, what is she going to do? Is she going to go? She's probably going to come into our business, uh, the, the hedge fund world. And so I'm trying to figure out she's trying to figure out, do I try and teach her myself my craft, which may be outdated because the future might be, some would say might be machines and models, or um, does she go the quant route as opposed to the macro discretionary route? Either way, she's probably going to be involved in macro. What I've told her, I said, listen, because she had a, a, a undergraduate degree in psychology, she got a master's in psychology, so she doesn't have the economics training. I was an economics major, you're an economist. And I said, here's what's gonna happen. No matter what you do, when you graduate, you're going to go to the Bridgewater website, and you're gonna get on uh, economicprinciples.com, where there are over 2,000 pages. And I said, you're gonna read every single page because if you wanna truly understand macroeconomics, there literally is no better education than what's available publicly on that website. And just as someone who consumes virtually everything that's written on modern economic theory, macro, et cetera, I would kind of uh, liken Bridgewater to uh, the charter school movement in education, where you had traditional public education, and then 30 years ago, practitioners by doing created a new way of teaching in classrooms that has been extraordinarily successful, and you can see the side-by-side -side metrics, and there's not even a comparison. So I would say, uh, that I'm so thankful to be having this conversation with what I think is uh, certainly the greatest, uh, uh, one of the greatest economists living today, who's made economics understandable and comprehensible and relevant, and it's because you are a practitioner as opposed to a theorist living in academia. And um, all I've got to say is, is that you're really good now, but I actually think that when you die, you're going to be really famous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could look forward to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's good news there, right? <laughs> uh, Paul and I, uh, Paul and I have known uh, each other for about 30 years. You were uh, clerking on the uh, Cotton Exchange, uh, and uh, so it was about 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, and so, um, anyway, you can tell we've fallen in love with each other yeah. since. So, um, and, you know, well, I won't take the time to give you, to give the back at you, because we got a little bit of time and, um, and we can talk about that. We, um, like, I just uh, wrote a piece. I'm, I'm now at a stage of my life which I'm sharing some thoughts. And so, yeah, I put those things on a website, and I also do LinkedIn. And so, um, I just wrote a piece for Bridgewater and also a piece for uh, LinkedIn that'll come out today, which is uh, titled, The World Has Gone Mad and the System is Broken. And so uh, Paul and I talk about that. Can, but can I just say one thing? It was so funny because over the last couple of days, ever since we decided to do this, I kept thinking, okay, you've got to control yourself because I know this is going to be on 
uh, Yahoo Finance. You've got you got to be careful what you say um, because you don't want to have it uh, come back uh, and be a problem for you down the road. Because when you look, and I can't wait to read your newsletter to see just how how actually honest you were. Because when you look at it, you're going, "Oh my lord, this is not even real." Right. So. <laughs> So I think we should talk about why it's not even real. Um, so how, how about you get you give it the first go? I'm going to just start with saying uh, Donald Trump is the greatest salesman in the history of this country. He has somehow been able to move the Republican Party into believing that a 5% budget deficit adjusted for the economic strength that we have right now is a reasonable proposition and one that is uh, good government policy. And then similarly, he has through, and I'm being charitable here, great moral suasion, convinced the Federal Reserve Board that running negative real rates with a 50-year low in unemployment is also reasonable monetary policy with no consequences. I, what, I, what I really loved in Chairman Powell's last Fed meeting when they asked him, are there any excesses? Are there any bubbles? He goes, no, no, I, I, I really can't see any. Uh, I think that you know we don't have the problems that we had in 2008, et cetera. And um, it's like asking somebody uh, why they're driving funny and not mentioning the fact they had 10 shots of vodka beforehand because clearly the low interest rate policy that we're pursuing is creating an excess and the excess in, is in our public deficits, which, you know, in the, at the current pace in less than 10 years, we will have exceeded that threshold where Greece had its issue. So I, look, I just look at the fiscal monetary mix. It's the most stimulative that I think I've ever seen, again, economically adjusted. And it is no wonder the stock market's at, at new highs. It's, it's, it's literally, I think, uh, the most conducive environment, certainly in the short run, for economic growth and strength that I've ever seen. And you add on top of that uh, a consolidated 11% budget deficit in China, the second biggest economy, 3% in Japan. Wow, it's it's a it's a it's a heady brew, it's a heady economic brew that we're all consuming. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, I'll give you my thoughts. Uh, there, um, I have a template which is that there's um, productivity over a period of time raises our living standards. And so how you invent and change um, and improve is one, is one of the things over a long period of time. Um, and then there's a short-term debt cycle, which we call a business cycle, uh, which we're now 10 years into and it's long. Um, and then most importantly, there's a long-term debt cycle. Um, and the long-term debt cycle means that you can always hit uh, the economy with stimulation. You can always give it a jolt. Um, and so um, the way that we used to do that was with interest rate cuts. But when you hit zero, like in 19, 2008 and 2009, we hit zero. Just like in 1929 and 32, we hit zero. The same thing happens in terms of the need to print money and buy financial assets. And that printing of money and buying financial assets, about $15 trillion, has created a, the mechanics of it is, you, you could not print the money, but the mechanics of it is that there is the purchases of those financial assets by the central bank, who gives money to the central bank, to investors, who sell their bonds, and now they have $15 trillion more money. And so we now, have, and that's created the paradigm that we have. And so anybody who's in the investment business right now or an investor knows 
that the world is awash with money. And the reason that is, is because investors take that money and they buy other investments. And so there's an abundance of money. For, for those who have credit worthiness, they can borrow. That produced a mechanical reaction in which um, the uh, interest rates were low in relationship to the return on equity for companies, so they would buy their equity back, they would merge, and there would be acquisitions. And it pushed the interest rates so low that we have such low interest rates and negative interest rates in some countries and near negative interest rates here. And so the world is looking for a yield. And because the world is looking for a yield for something, um, um, companies also can sell dreams rather than earnings. So we're living in a world now where you no longer really as much need earnings. So the number of companies that produce earnings um, is the lowest since the dot-com bubble in terms of their need because you can sell a dream. And so there's a reaching for the yield, and we have a negative. And this, um, as a result of the accumulation of the money at the top and technology, uh, we have a situation in which, naturally, those who have money have a lot of money in credit, and those, it doesn't trickle down. It, it's not going to trickle down because we also have a system where at the, at the lower ends, the balance sheets, the income statement, the nature of lending is not the same. And so it doesn't trickle down. And as a result, we have a large wealth gap. And so uh, we have a situation with a large wealth gap. So there are three things that exist today that haven't existed at any time since the 1930s. You know, one of the main things in my life that I've learned is that whenever I've been surprised, it's because uh, of things that haven't happened to me before, uh, and mostly in, haven't happened in my lifetime. So that I've had it to study history, and because if it's happened before. And those three things that are happening today um, are uh, last happened in the 1935 to 40 period. And, and what I mean is, first, there is a large wealth gap. It's a big thing. It'll change, it'll affect markets, it'll affect our society in a very important way. So at, that wealth gap produces populism of the left and populism of the right, and there's a war that is going on. And that war has a big effect on markets and it has a big effect on, on economies, it has a big effect on markets. So if we were to say, what would be the impact, let's say, of a, um, a, a democratic election and how, taxes will change as a result of that tech, corporate taxes and so on. They'll be unwound. And so that will be an issue in pricing of markets and so on. But there's a large wealth gap that's not being dealt with. So the large, so there's a large wealth gap at the time that there's not effective monetary policy. So number one, large wealth gap and political gap and polarity that we are at each other's throats and, and it is not functional the combination of how the media and the political system works or doesn't work together is a major problem. Number two, very much like the 30s, number two is the absence of the effectiveness of monetary policy because you can't make it go further. Europe is dead in the water, Japan is dead in the water, and so you can't just print more money and put it in the hands of investors and that system is just is not gonna work. So now you have to deal with the mechanics <clears throat> of um, do you have political coordination? I don't think so. Do you have political coordination working with monetary coordination? Politicians can't be coordinated with each other, and they can't be coordinated with uh, monetary policy. So you don't have the stimulant. Now let's imagine you have a downturn, and you don't have a good stimulant, very similar to the 1930s. Okay, it's not a pretty picture. If we have a wealth gap that we're at each other's throats, and this is when times are good, when the stock markets are high and the unemployment rates are low, imagine what it's going to be like when we get a downturn, and a downturn will come. When we get a downturn, we don't have effective monetary policy. And number three in that time is the, um, uh, the important thing, is the change in um, the, world, the world order. Um, meaning, what we have now is not a um, 
unipolar world. We, we, we don't have, history has shown that um, periods of peace follow periods of war because there becomes a dominant world power and you create a world order. And no one wants to fight the dominant world power. And that's been the nature of what we've had since essentially World War II. And then when there's a rise of a, a, a power to challenge an existing power, then there is conflict. There's going to be conflict. There are going to be certainly lots of things to disagree with. And so when we deal with, the, let's say, the rise of China or other countries, or perhaps the decline of the United States in some ways, um, we have things to argue about. So there's different kinds of wars. We call them wars. But there's, there's a trade war. There's a technology war. There's a geopolitical war. And um, there could be a capital war. The capacity of that war to, is, is a material thing. So when we look at that analogous position, I would say um, you, you're at the end of the, 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 a cycle, meaning the force that drove us from 2008 and 9, the bottom in 2008 and 9, to where we are today, which was quantitative easing and the lowering of interest rates and corporate tax cuts, cannot push us farther. We can't go farther. And from there, we have those elements of risk. So when I look at it is, yes, it's crazy. It's crazy that we have negative uh, bond yield. We're, in my opinion, we're near the end, in late stages, of a reserve currency system. We have a fiat monetary system. So when you talk about, let's say, the, uh, the, that, not only um, we have negative rates, but yes, we're going to have much larger deficits. We need to have. Because if you, because how do you get the money spent? So there's going to be much bigger deficits. You're talking about the next downturn. Well, we're going to have bigger de deficits if we didn't have a downturn. Right. Because we have record deficits no, no, no. without it. I, and then when you put a downturn on it and you take it cyclical, and that's not half the story. That's not half the story. It's not half the story because the larger story are the unfunded liabilities. They're, those unfunded liabilities are pension liabilities and they're health care liabilities. Those are promises to deliver. So we're living here in the state and we understand that. And so you, have, you could call it debt or you can call it pension liabilities. But we have pension liabilities. We have a lot of IOUs that are either going to be funded by tax increases or they'll have to be spending cuts. And we in the state of Connecticut know it's not humane to cut any expenditures anymore, and you can't raise taxes anymore either. And so then you're dealing with, that's a country problem. And then you're going to need to, how are you going to deal with that? You're going to print money. Because what you're going to do is you run a deficit, you're going to have to spend it. That's the difference between what you face, Governor, and what the, the federal government is. They can print money. So they can run deficits, and they can then print the money to do it. And that's what classically happens at the late stage. That's your, that's your model. That's your modern monetary theory. That is what we call, uh, what is call, recently it's been called mon money, mon modern monetary theory. There's nothing modern about this. Um, there's, not, there's nothing modern about it. So if, what I'm saying is, if you look at history, nothing is new in history. You go back in, in, in history, and what we used to call it is pushing on a string. And so when you have pushing on a string, in other words, you can't, no longer can you print money, no longer can you lower in, interest rates. You go to what I call monetary policy three. Monetary policy one is you lower interest rates, and that stimulates. You can't, when that runs out, you go to the second type of monetary policy, which is you buy financial assets with printed money. When that runs out, which is out, um, then you go to monetary policy three. It has various forms. And that form has to do with governments running deficits, or they can also call it helicopter money in various ways, running deficits that the central bank monetizes. And it can take all different forms, but that's what you get. And that is a classic you know, reserve currency question in a fiat monetary system, I think. And so isn't it mad? That, that when the next downturn, we're going to have lower interest rates, we're going to print the money, 
and that you're holding that with the negative interest rates. Wait, and then, and can, then, can and it doesn't. Say, so the system doesn't work. This, uh, it's gone mad. And then it, the reason the system is broken is because there is not. It's not an equal opportunity system. It's uh, um, uh, there's justifiable complaints about the failure of that system to produce education, to do those things. These people are justifiably saying this is broken because the system ha is broken. It needs to be reformed in a way that works better, works better. In other words, let's increase the size of the pie. If it's done smart, you can increase productivity with the increasing the size of the pie at the same time as you could divide it better. Anyway, I'm going on too long, but yeah, it means that. I'm going to let you breathe a second. Um, <laughs> modern monetary theory, I love it because when I hear people talk about it, and attach some formality to it. I can't help but think about the evolution of uh, its acceptance. It's kind of the same way that if you think about marijuana, its acceptance has changed over time. Because 50 years ago, it was illegal, reprehensible, reprehensible. So modern monetary theory, can you imagine Paul Volcker even considering modern monetary theory? Then. Then about 30 years ago, we just said no. Same thing with mar marijuana. Then 20 years ago, all of a sudden, we medicinalized it. And Japan actually began to implement the equivalent of modern monetary policy when they began to uh, buy their own government debt. And then about 15 years ago, uh, because it was medicinalized, we then had to decriminalize it. And then 10 years ago, it got widespread adoption because the United States did, Europe did, a variety of countries did. And now we're at a point where it's so widely accepted that we sugarcoat it, put it in gummy bear form, uh, and it's just a, this widely accepted next stage when there's a problem. Because the next deficit, the typical recession, means that uh, the budget deficit is going to increase somewhere between 10 and 30 percent. Can you imagine adding? Can you imagine an, a, a 10 or 15 percent budget deficit in the United States in the next downturn? So uh, it's, in, it's incredible to me because, again, I'll, I'll, I'll look at where we are. I mean, if you just think about the divisiveness that we have in this country now, think about we have a 5 percent budget deficit. Say normalize, if we just went back and normalized it at two, so you take off 3 percent, $600 billion, if we subtracted that from where we are economically today, that works out to about 10% of an average family's income. So imagine if we didn't have that 3% that we're borrowing from our children, that we're fast forwarding on consumption. Can but we're not going to pay it back. <laughs> just, I'm just saying, you, uh, and, and I hear you. And, um, and that's why I, I, look at, I look at the world right now. And i um, and I look at the asset pricing, and the whole thing is just, uh, it's so, it's so uh, incredible to me. If I think about just this next election and the difference between Donald Trump and Elizabeth Warren, we did this uh, poll internally about where the S&P would trade if Elizabeth Warren became president. Uh, and then we took the bet, and then Biden and Buttigieg and... Uh, uh, Kolbachar, et cetera. And then we took the election probabilities. And so our poll said if, the, if Elizabeth Warren was elected, the S&P would trade around 2250. I think it's at 3050 now. Uh, but I'm just saying her policies probably would, 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 assuming that they were implemented, probably would give you something like that. And then if you just take the election probabilities, that would imply, uh, and apply, what would if you anchor that, I think Buttigieg and Bi Biden were like 2,700. Because again, they're going to come in, raise taxes. Um, that's going to cause probably some economic contraction. Uh, so that would imply that Donald Trump, if he gets reelected, the S&P's worth 3,600. So as an investor, you have to have a view on the election because the outcomes are so extreme. I've never seen this kind of polarity 
uh, in the elections as we have now. And they always say, oh, well, it doesn't make any difference who president is. You know, the markets rallied 53% of the time under Democrats and 52% of the time. It does make a difference. Ronald Reagan, when he became president, was a huge difference to the stock market. And I would say who the next president is, is also going to have a huge impact on the economy, the stock market, particularly asset pricing. Because clearly, asset prices today, whether it's U.S. stocks, whether it's interest rates, whether it's the dollar, it's all priced off of, in my opinion, a 5% budget deficit with this incredibly overly stimulative uh, fiscal policy combined with this overly stimulative monetary policy is creating this U.S. exceptionalism that one day, like if we normalized our deficit to where Europe is right now, would have a completely different uh, valuations for the stock market, valuations for uh, the dollar. The dollar would be substantially lower, I believe. So this next presidential election and what policies they pursue afterwards, I think this one, is going to be more meaningful than anyone, certainly in my lifetime. So it's going to be really I, interesting. I, 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 I agree with you. So I'm, I'm um, mechanistic. I'm not ideological. I'm um, just mechanistic. So I do th go through the calculations. And um, if you take the way corporate taxes would change, mm -hmm. the undoing of that, um, that's worth 7 or 8%. Mm -hmm. If you take... Um, the changes in gap accounting, that so changes in the tax the taxes for corporations, that's worth about fifteen percent of earnings, and it will therefore would drop it on the basis of that alone. <clears throat> if you take then the wealth tax is two point eight trillion dollars over ten years, and so that'll have an effect. So it is, and then that doesn't have to do with regulation and the changes in regulation. I think we are dealing with the question, uh, again, uh, like the 30s. Is it populism of the left or is it populism of the right? And how is that going to work? And that's not just an American issue. It's a, uh, it's a UK issue in Jeremy Corbyn. It's a UK. So, the, so we have an issue in terms of that politics will certainly matter to asset prices. But at the same time, I'm saying we have not made capitalism work for the average person. You and I spend a lot of time talking about philanthropy, and, and Paul has, Paul really has taught me a lot, and he's been a role model for me through the Robin Hood Foundation of being able to uh, do all sorts of things, and, and, and then we have Just Give and uh, the things that he's done. So he and I know and really deeply believe in the fact that the system is unfair and is, in many cases, uneconomical, because what um, what is the economics? Uh, how is it economically sensible to not have to spend the money to get kids through high school, those disadvantaged and disengaged kids? Just to put that there, we're, I'm, it's such a pleasure to do with the governor in the state of Connecticut to be able to um, cost effectively get kids through high school because uh, it, it, it's relatively economic, it, it's cheap to do that. And yet the cost of incarceration, state, I think you're, the number is $600 million a year spends on incarceration. The probability of what that changes in their life um, in terms of what their lives are like, what their impact in terms of crime, we talk about crime in Hartford, Connecticut, and those things, and the cost on the society, the cost on the environment, makes that a peanuts type of expenditure. And the government doesn't do those things. So when we look at the well-being of the, of the country, and you look at what are the things that determine a country that, is, that goes ahead well, you have to have something that, it, that is a fair system that strikes for something like equal opportunity. And you have to have something that invests in education, and infrastructure and those kinds of things in order to make a healthier society. So we have both of those that it, things are existing. The, I think the key question is whether we're going to be able to come together as a as um, no, not demonize each side. You know, in other words, um, uh, it, 
Ah, there's a demonization and there's a split that's going on and there's not a thoughtfulness in terms of how to engineer it because we could make those, those pie, the pie increase. You know in terms of your programs that I'm, and I'm looking at my programs that the economic return on investment of finding those things that could be done that edu educate people and so on, um, the all-in return on those investments are, are excellent. But you have a, uh, when you have a state that doesn't have a, can't have a budget, they can't invest in education. So we need to re-engineer that, but the we is the key question. Will we do it together or will we do it like we're going to kill each other? And, and that'll have capital flows implication because we're going to run large budget deficits. And then if you, if you <clears throat> capitalist, <clears throat> capital stays where they like capitalism and capitalism needs to be fixed. And if you don't fix it, you're going to have a revolution. And if you and and then you're going to also chase the capitalists away. Yeah. So, just so we're clear, to me, the fixing capitalism is so easy. Uh, it, it, there's you love measurement metrics. Fifty years ago, six and a half percent of corporate revenues went to shareholders. Today, that number is thirteen percent. Why did it go from six and a half? Where it'd been fairly stable for uh, since the war. Why did it go to 13%? Milton Friedman said in 1970, the purpose of a corporation is to maximize profits. Then Gordon Gecko, famously, in 1987 said, greed is good. And all of us here, certainly, I, I, I remember that movie. We thought, wow, greed is good. Greed. And he said, greed for knowledge, greed for love. Greed is good. Well, greed got us the opioid crisis, which killed nearly a million Americans. Greed's got us wealth disparity that's five times where it was 50 years ago. Uh, and greed has created the greatest divisiveness this, this country's ever had. And so shareholders, the shareholder primacy, if you just think about it, there's $2 trillion of corporate profits. 50 years ago, a trillion of that would have gone to employees, the 90 million American workers. It would have gone to communities. It would have gone to saving the planet. It would have gone to customers. But now it goes to increasingly the 1%. And there wasn't, it wasn't by uh, design. There wasn't a plebiscite. And it wasn't because bad people uh, or, or because good people did bad things or anything like that. It was unfortunately just a natural unchecked movement because of the fact that we as a culture thought business is where you make your money and that's all that you do. 45% of our waking time that we're not uh, eating uh, or that we're not uh, or that we're not recreating or commuting is spent at work. We're never going to fix the social problems that address us today if we do not start in the workplace and the easiest, the easiest place to start is we have 6 million employees of public companies that today do not make a living wage, that live under the poverty line, 6 million. So hopefully culturally, and this is why, this is where just capital, hopefully organically, we can make everyone think, okay, uh, whether I'm a shareholder or I sit on a board, I have an employee that's not making a living wage, and yet we're paying ourselves dividends, we're engaging in share buybacks, et cetera. Is that really the American way? Is that fair? Shouldn't I first be thinking about that group of stakeholders that are so critical? And just remember, those six million employees that are living under the, making, not making a living wage, living under the poverty line, are being subsidized, right? by all of us in this room. So it's actually a tax on the rest of society to have a worker that works for your company that doesn't make a living wage. So I'm so excited that we're talking about stakeholder capitalism so that we can begin to move back to that balance where we were 50 years ago. Just one last thing. 50 years ago, oh, by the way, in 1969, 1968, 1967, when shareholder profits were 6.5% of the pie, GDP was double what it is right now. It was double what it is right now. So 
you can, it's, if you think about blank sheet of paper, if we're solving for the perfect society, what level of profits and compensation do we need to have to encourage Ray Dalio, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, the entrepreneurs of the world to go create businesses? Is it, does it have to be where it is right now with this enormous creation between uh, the least paid and the highest paid? And again, another question would be CEO pay. Uh, if a question that I would ask as a shareholder and as a, a director is, how many employees do we have not making a living wage relative to what I am paying the CEO? It's a legitimate cultural, social, moral, ethical question to ask. And hopefully we're going to start asking that in every damn boardroom. I don't think that's, I don't think that's going to work. Uh, <laughs> I love right. Well, I, uh, what I mean is... This is the same discussion you and I had uh, last year on the yeah. wagon. Yeah. Not, not that wagon, but the, uh, the quail <laughs> wagon. Uh. Um, I, th uh, I think everybody has their own particular way of dealing with it. And so everybody sort of says, do it this way, do it that way. Um, and you think we need legislation? And we Let me need... tell you what I think. Okay. I know what you told me once. I okay, but well, I can do better than that. Okay, good. Um, I, I think we need to do it t together. I think that there's, look, everybody's got their way of doing it, and everybody's backbiting their other way. And, and everybody, we have to do it, first of all, if it was done together. I think the President of the United 100 States. 100% agree. That the President of the United States should declare it an emergency issue, or somebody. The only thing that matters is who has their hands on the levers of power. Nothing's going to happen. We can scream all we want or whatever. We all have our own, but it's chaotic. So it, it has to be treated as a national emergency, that we have this wealth gap and we're going to kill each other. And so then you have to say that that is brought together in a bipartisan or nonpartisan way with knowledgeable people. And that's what Barbara's doing with the, with the state of Connecticut in terms of putting that together. You bring in all the constituents, people who are both knowledgeable economically and also are on the ground. You know, we know Jeff Canada, Harlem Children's Zone. That's a man who is, knows what it's like to be on the ground because we people could be just theoretical, thinking we know it better. No, you, you want to learn from those people on the ground and then you want to engineer it together. I would lock them up in a place for six months and say, it, you can't come out of that place until you reach an agreement that is both smart, that increases the size of the pie, and also divides the pie well. Because I believe that there are a lot of high return on investment things. Like if you look at the all-in return on, ec on education or something, if it's done well, I don't think we're going to do that. I think that's what's required. And, but I don't think we're going to do that. I think we're going to try to kill each other. That we're going to try to kill each other. We're now in, a, in an environment in which, um, I, I, you know, I, I have a principle, which is um, when the cause that you are behind is more important to you than the system for resolving your disputes, the system is in jeopardy. Right? That's what the situ situation we are. The causes in the battle is more important to all those people to get their way than the systematic way of working together to try to say, how do we be in this together to resolve that? Uh, so I think that's what you need to yeah, do. Yeah, I'm need needless to say, we wouldn't have spent all our time that we do in the not for profit causes if we didn't think that there were a whole variety of bottoms up ways of attacking this problem with true practitioners on the ground. So that I agree with. Um, and I do think it's going to take a combination of changing what we do uh, in philanthropy and, and amplifying that. You see, the, the reason why I get so focused on uh, the private sector side and companies in particular is Philanthropy is 400 billion. The 
the federal government's four trillion, and business is sixteen trillion. So business is forty times the size of uh, private philanthropy. So we've got to use all three working together exactly the way you said to expand the pie, maximize each of those three different sectors so that we can uh, go back to having a country that is united and happy and tolerant and loving and giving towards each other. We, we have the greatest country in the whole world. We, we just need, as you say, to uh, take the time, bring the intellectual capital and get us back on track. I think it's time for us to go. Yeah. That was a wonderful Thanks, discussion. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. It's always fun. Such a treat. Well, Ray and Paul have certainly given us all many things to think about. They set the tone for the day, and I'm sure many of these topics, things like stakeholder capitalism, will come up throughout the sessions. The 2019 Greenwich Economic Forum is brought to you by Bridgewater Associates. Meaningful work, meaningful relationships. Churchill Asset Management, Nuveen, a leading provider of senior and uni trench debt to middle market companies. Ropes and Gray, bright past, brilliant future. Aurora Capital, inspiring partnerships. And Gramercy Funds Management, we are emerging markets. Special considerations to Bank of America. Life's better when we are connected. NOAA Private Wealth Management, a leading wealth and asset management service provider in China. Gotai Jinan Futures, a leading brokerage firm for commodity futures and financial futures in China. China Industrial Securities, a comprehensive financial group providing full spectrum financial services in Hong Kong. And Titan Advisors, built like a hedge fund. Special thanks to the Financial Times and Greenwich Business Institute for hosting us. And thank you to all the sponsors who helped make this event possible. We'll be right back after these messages. Don't go away.